be here at this beautiful place. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I met Tatiana at the Consciousness Conferences, and I have to remember to speak more slowly. So, um, I'm interested in the problem of consciousness, what it is, how the brain produces it, if the brain does produce it, and uh, what we know about it. And the question I'm going to discuss is whether quantum physics is necessary to understand consciousness. So, let's start with the question of what is consciousness. And we take it for granted that when we open our eyes, the world out there appears inside our head. Bing. And Bing is meant to imply subjective experience, having a conscious moment, as opposed to behavior we might do that need not be conscious, that we might do automatically on autopilot or as a zombie. So Bing, if you see Bing during this talk, it is meant to imply consciousness. So what Bing actually is, how it's produced, is the problem, is the question that I'm going to try to address. But it's, the, the problem is addressed by, in many ways, um, so the neuroscientist probes the brain, uh, looking at electrical signals or whatever, the roboticist or artificial intelligence guy tries to simulate it, the artist uh, tries to capture the essence of consciousness in artwork, the physicist ponders the nature of reality, uh, superposition, Schrodinger's cat, the psychiatrist uh, looks inward toward the subconscious, the anesthesiologist, who for some reason looks like me, studies how anesthesia works. And uh, meditators, of course, go inward. And the traditional Greek uh, uh, Western philosophers ponder consciousness. Let's begin by asking a question. When did consciousness arise in the course of the universe? So for example, uh, we have the Big Bang uh, 14 or so uh, billion years ago, up until fairly recently. And uh, some people say that con consciousness or being <coughs> happened fairly recently with tools, uh, language, uh, fairly recently in the course of, uh, of human or uh, primate development. <coughs> Others would say earlier, for example, with animal cells, eukaryotes, or some at the Cambrian explosion, which was in between, big explosion in development, or with first life, with all life being conscious, and some would say even before the Big Bang, spiritual approaches and some, uh, even Western philosophers say that. But let's just boil this down to, to one division and ask which came first, consciousness or life? Now most people, uh, if you took a vote across the world, among neuroscientists, psychologists, most Western philosophers, would probably say that life gave rise to consciousness that life uh, was there first and that consciousness emerged from living systems, perhaps from computation in brains, or maybe earlier, but some property of living systems. That would probably get the most votes, although it's, it's actually getting closer. The other general idea is panpsychism, or Eastern philosophy and spirituality, Whitehead, Alfred North Whitehead, quantum approaches, in which consciousness is intrinsic to the universe and has been here all along. So if consciousness is a property of all matter or of all quantum state collapses, for example, uh, it would have been here before life and could have actually prompted life, could have been a, a, a stimulus to life. We'll come back to that point. Now, in Western philosophy, the world out there is all in our head. Bang, we create a representation of the world out there. And Plato realized that this would, might poorly portray reality, that what's really out there may be more uh, complex and more dimensional than what we perceive. So he had Plato's cave where he had these, these guys who could only look straight ahead and could only see shadows on the cave wall from a fire behind them. And for them, two-dimensional motion was fine, reality. They were happy with that. That's all they knew, and that was acceptable. So this implies to some people that there's a deeper level of reality that we don't normally access, although we can under certain circumstances. Now Descartes uh, followed this up and said we could each be, he realized that the only thing, we didn't really know what was out there. Uh, 
and we could each be a mere brain in a vat fed information by an evil genius. And here's a brain in a vat being fed information by a computer, bang, I'm walking outside in the sun. And there have been a lot of very interesting movies along these lines. Um, <coughs> the point is that both consciousness and reality may be illusion. Consciousness uh, may be an illusion in, in Western science because it comes too late and it's epiphenomenal. And reality may be an illusion because we don't really know what's out there. Now, on the other hand, in Eastern philosophy, consciousness per pervades a deeper level of reality. Bing is everywhere. So we're kind of like waves in a big sea of consciousness. This is kind of the Eastern spiritual tradition. And in some sense, quantum approaches accommodate this as well. We'll come back to that. Now, let's, go, let's look at the modern science, the Western, Western uh, scientific view, that the brain is a computer. So here's a, a bunch of neurons, uh, neural networks, and uh, they're connected by synapses, as we know, and they can fire or not fire. They can, they're much more complicated than that, but, but taking the most simplistic view, they're likened to uh, computer switching matrices where you have nodes and switches and variable weights, and this comparison this analogy between the brain neurons and computer is the most powerful uh, paradigm that there is in, uh, in, in modern science philosophy, philosophy, even though it's probably wrong, for reasons we can come back to. Now, generally speaking, uh, I'm, I'm going to explain why consciousness comes too late. Conscious perception occurs several hundred milliseconds after sensory input. So if uh, visual, a visual input or auditory or sensory input goes to the thalamus from whichever sense organ. In the case of vision, it goes to the back of the brain, V1, which is not conscious. And then in step two, it goes to the front of the brain, and two is not conscious. And then this third wave from the front of the brain to various parts of the brain, that is conscious. That's where Bing happens in this third wave. But this is several hundred milliseconds after <coughs> sensory input. And quite often we've already responded. If you say something real quick to me, or say something, I'll respond within 100 milliseconds. But the activity corresponding to what you said happens afterwards. Therefore, the conclusion is that consciousness comes too late to be in, in control and is epiphenomenal. We're along for the ride. With quantum physics, we get around that with backward time effects uh, that have been documented pretty well. So, conscious perception, oh, so I replaced Bing here with a happy face, just, just for fun. So the, only this third wave is inhibited by anesthesia. This is really strange because the neurotransmitters and all the other neural activities in one and two are, seem to be the same, but only the third wave feedback is inhibited by anesthesia, selectively preventing consciousness with all different types of anesthesia. So that's a clue that something's happening in this third wave that's different. <coughs> And also that the mechanism of anesthesia holds the key to understanding consciousness, and I think that's true. Now, one